Ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce the director of this film, Mr. Stanley Nelson. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, thank you, oh my God. Thank you. Wow. Thanks. Thank you. I, I, don't make me cry up here now. Come on. Come on. Don't, don't, don't make me cry. Um, I, I want to I, I in, introduce my, Miles' nephew, uh, Vince Wilburn. Um, Miles' son, Aaron Davis. Aaron, Aaron, Aaron. Um, the voice of Miles in the film, the great actor Carl Lumley. Real quick, I, I, I want uh, Nicole London, who, who's not on the panel, but is here. Raise your hand, Nicole, the producer of the film. Oh, she's got her hand, hands full. Um, and two of, of the most incredible musicians, you know, in the world. Um, Herbie Hancock is in here somewhere. And Wayne Shorter, Wayne. Wayne Shorter. Um, for, for Herbie and Wayne, I, I want to thank you all so much for participating in, in the movie and, and for coming out tonight. That means so much to me. But, you know, also for all the music that, that, that you've given us. Um, just thank you so much. And continue to give us. And continue to give us. Thank you all. All right. Um, we're going to do this panel here. While, while they're getting seated, again, thank you all so much for, this is the uh, LA premiere, the West Coast premiere. Um, you know, we're so happy to, to be here. And, um, you know, we're going to be here. I, I forgot how long. How, is it a week or two weeks? We're, we're here. And, and we're here all day, every day, um, just like Spider-Man or the Avengers. So... <laughs> So please let people know. They don't have to wait till 7, 10 at night. Uh, please let people know. Um, I think, do, do people have questions? Because we can open it right up to questions. Yeah, there's one there. Thanks for this really beautiful and powerful and touching film. You know, too often, the discourse around black men is about anger uh, and frustration. But this film, in the mouth of David especially, we see the power of his beauty. As a, as a galvanizing force for those who loved him, those who followed him, those who were inspired by him. Please think about the power of black beauty as an organizing force in society. <laughs> okay, that question wasn't for me, that's for somebody else here. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I, I know I, as a filmmaker for me in making the film, what, one of the things that, that we were trying to do is just get a, a, a hint uh, of the beauty that, that Miles' music provided up on the screen. I mean, that was really something that, that we were really trying to do, you know, all, uh, all through the movie. And I, I think that, as you see, you know, um, you know Miles um, struggled through whatever demons he has, and, and we all have demons, to um, you know, make this incredible, beautiful music and, and challenging music you know, throughout his life. Um, anybody else want to take a shot at that one? <laughs> Go ahead. Why are you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, next question. Um, anybody else? Because, yeah. I guess I have a question for you and for uh, Mr. Hancock. Like, for you, the, the documentary is very complete. It has. Um, Thank you. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> it, the, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the documentary is very complete. Uh, you have basically every, you know, the, the major songs that uh, he was known for. So, talk a bit about how, you know, the the clearing and the whole process of getting this together because it seems like it might have taken you a while. And for you, Mr. Hancock, I, can you talk a little bit about what was your, uh, you know, talk about, take us back to, to those days and, uh, and what it was like to, you know, go in the studio with him and, you know, at such a young age. 
I'm gonna let you go. It was like being in school. <laughs> yeah, I, I was there. I was there to to not just to express but to learn. You know, you know. I mean, look at the band. It wasn't just Miles. I mean, it was Wayne Shorter, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And, and Brian Carter, right? And young Tony Williams. Yeah. So I learned from every one of those guys. You know, every day. And we all listened to each other. And we, we, we shared this voyage. Each time we sat down to play, it was a, a new voyage. You know, you know um, we looked for a new pathway, something that we hadn't tried before. But Miles was the instigator. He was the one that spoke about the challenge, that challenged us to, to find something new. He said, and I think it said in the, in the, in the film, it says, you know, I paid you to practice on the bandstand. <laughs> you know? And that that was how it really was. <laughs> and he he said, if I ever catch you trying to play just to get applause, he said, you out of here. <laughs> you know, he didn't want us to to do that just to please the crowd. We were offering something, you know. You know, we were like naked on the stage and offering what would come out of that, you know, uh, just being co- totally untethered, un- un- unclothed, so, so that our, our, our guts could hang out. And that's, that's the way Miles is played, you know. Yeah. Um, did we get Wayne a microphone? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I also wanted to ask you, Wayne, about what Miles, um, what you remember Miles told you about practicing or over-rehearsing over or over-practicing. Did he ever talk to you about that? He, he didn't. As far as I can remember, he rarely talked about music. He talked about, on his table, he had the books on architecture, and uh, uh, musical scores of, uh, and uh, the art world, sculpting and all that kind of stuff. But I never heard Miles being an artist talking about uh, things, like, like thing, we're going to rehearse this and we're going to rehearse that. You just say, what you got? Let's uh, let's try this. Let's try that. And uh, he said, "I can't play this shit. <laughs> <laughs> I can't play. I can't play that shit, man." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, and I was there when he said, "I feel like a thief," <laughs> because he played maybe like 45 minutes, but for the first time when he crossed the, into the concert. You know, instead of nightclubs. And uh, so, when Miles first called, I didn't need this. When Miles first called me to be in his band, I had just joined R. Blakey Jazz Messengers. R. Blakey. And Miles was on the phone and said, You want to be my band? <laughs> I said, I just got together with the Messengers. And he's a little silent, and I said, but for me to leave, I don't think nobody likes a Benedict Arnold. And he said, I know what you mean. When you're ready, let me know. I said, okay. So we're timing each other to hang up the phone simultaneously. I said, clack, clack. That's that. Other questions for anybody up here? Let me, let me take that one back there. Yeah, you? Me? Yep. Aaron and his cousin, did either of you choose a music career? And Aaron, did any of your siblings, what profession did they choose for themselves? Uh, hi. Um, well, 
My sister over here, Cheryl, she's right over here. Cheryl Ann Cheryl! Davis. She was, she is a, was, is an educator. Uh, she taught, taught children for many years. Uh, I'm not very close with the, with, the, with the other two siblings I had, uh, but I know that Gregory played trumpet for a while, but I don't think it ever went anywhere. Vince and I both played in his band. I played electronic percussion, which I knew absolutely nothing about, but again, you're supposed to sink or swim, so swim, you know? And uh, Vince, Vince can tell you about his experience. I first recorded with Uncle Miles in 1979 on a record called Man With A Horn. And he brought me my first drum kit. I grew up in the south side of Chicago, like Herbie, Quincy Jones. Um, and uh, we just finished a record called The Rubber Band Sessions from the 80s. I have a band called The Miles Electric Band. We played the Hollywood Bowl last year for the um, Playboy Jazz Fest. And Stanley and I are working on the soundtrack for this documentary. So I play drums, so, you know. I've, I've been around. <laughs> Yeah, as, as Vince uh, mentioned Chicago, it, it, it made me realize that, you know, we are going to Chicago with this, with the movie, and Vince, and, and are you going to Chicago, Aaron? And Aaron, we're all going to Chicago, St. Louis, uh, a whole bunch of other places. If you go to milesdavismovie.com, you can see the whole schedule of, of, of where we go. So, like, we're opening up a, di a different city every week, and, and as the film opens, we're going there and doing Q&A. So we will be in Chicago, for those who applauded about Chicago. It will be in St. Louis and East St. Louis, uh, New Orleans, Atlanta, uh, the Bay Area, all of those places where we're all going and, um, you know, and doing the q and I just want get, to get a question for Carl. Carl, talk, talk a little bit about how you prepared for this, because you're so great in it. What did what, what, you do to, uh, to get yourself that Miles Davis sound? Um, I, um, I, like many people I grew up knowing of, um, being afraid of, uh, being told not to listen to uh, or pay attention to Miles Davis. He was like um, Robin Hood. You knew he was out there in the woods, um, taking from the rich, um, taking from the culture that was robbing so many and giving back to everyone, including the majority culture, showing by example that uh, genius and excellence knew no color and that spirit was all binding. Uh, so when you, another master um, in my mind, um, and I had had an opportunity to voice a project uh, for Stanley some time ago, um, when I heard that this project was happening and I sent in a tape and got the call, um, there wasn't a lot of time. And my father always said that uh, work expands to fit the time allotted. <laughs> so in about a week's time, I put in a lot of work. And um, I think... There was always a Miles I heard in my head, even though I, I met Miles once in a cab, but we didn't share um, very much. Uh, he, the cab pulled up in New York, I had just moved to New York, and a woman got out of the back of the cab, and I rushed to jump in, because the cab had stopped, and uh, Miles was paying off the driver, and um, I realized it was him, and because, as an actor, I'm incredibly articulate. I said, Miles Davis. <laughs> and he said, uh, yeah, brother, I gotta get out. <laughs> I, I know for a fact that those of you who worked with him and some of you out here who knew him very well, all of you have, uh, probably your own voice of Miles in your head that you can do, probably, uh, given the amount of time that you uh, spent with him, better than I did. But the voice that Miles gave to me was much more 
about the way it felt than the way it sounded, about a kind of a courage, knowing his story about reinventing yourself and reinventing pieces of the world as you do so, believing that you had the right to do that, knowing that you were a flawed individual and that whether you believed in the deity or not, that God would forgive you um, and you would move forward. I, I loved Miles like I knew him. And when I had a chance to do this voice, it was mostly because I wanted to just run through this material in his words and have that inside me. So this was a privilege that um, I, I, there are a few things that I've done in my career that I, I feel as proud of as having even this whisper of something to do with this project. It's, uh, it's uh, I, I just all I can say is thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a, 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 quick, a quick little story about, about recording. Um, with Carl, you know, we found that you know that that when Carl would would would, uh, would have to curse as Miles, he'd have to, you know, say bullshit, uh, motherfucker, you know that 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 the takes would be really great, and so, so so I would say, okay, Carl, just say motherfucker, 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 <laughs> and 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 then say the line, <laughs> and it always come out right. <laughs> uh, yeah, go ahead. Francis Taylor is delightful in this film and brutally honest. Mm. You, Francis Taylor. Can you add any more about her? I thought she was wonderful. Um, yeah, I, um, sadly, Francis Taylor passed away at um, Thanksgiving of last year. Um, she never did get to see the film. Um, Francis was that person that you see in the film. I mean, she was just, you know, um, that rare human being where she you know was incredibly beautiful but also she was really funny i mean you know you know you know when i was going to interview her uh uh greg tate you know um the ultimate hipster who's in the film and he said you know you're you're gonna love francis she got jokes francis got jokes <laughs> <laughs> you know and like you know you, you know when i would look back at at the takes of the film i was like was she pulling my leg or, or what because she's, you know, all that leg, those leg jokes. So, but Fran Francis was, um, Francis was something else. And, uh, you know, I was just, it was kind of one of those people that you just were like, I, you know, I'm so glad that I got to be in her presence, you know. Yeah. Um, with regards to this film, was this, your scene had your uh, relatives. Did you feel that this was a story that his story always needed to be told? Or was it one of those things where, his story really needs to be told right now for a specific reason. Um, say, like, with regards to how, like, changes in music um, have taken place over the decade. It was just like, people really need to know, understand exactly who he was to understand why music is also, where it's come from and where it is now. Really? No, I'm just gonna I'm not a relative, so next question. <laughs> Just joking. I know I, 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 I'm not. I'm not related. I, well, you know, we we felt comfortable with Stanley because you know we met with him. And he, you know, right, cuz he, Cheryl, Aaron, he, he just, we just felt like he, you know, we signed the papers and away we went, you know. But it was, it was a, it was a, a, a comfort, Stanley, that we felt that Stanley could get it done, you know. And we didn't see anything until it was, until he sent the link, you know. He sent the link one night at about eleven o'clock at night, and 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 there our manager sent it to us, and Aaron looked at it, and Cheryl looked at it, and we live here on on the on the, on the west coast, and Stanley lives on the east coast. And uh, I finished about one o'clock in the morning, and I was so excited and crying, and I called Stanley. I said, Stanley, man, this movie's a motherfucker. It's so beautiful, man. So <laughs> he said, Man, I'm asleep. I'll call you tomorrow. <laughs> I thought he was going to talk to me about it and talk me through it and say, man, don't cry, man. It's going to be all right. <laughs> said, man, I'll call you tomorrow. <laughs> but, it was, you know, I think if I can speak for our family, I think, we're, you know, we're very proud of, of Stanley and the film. Yeah. Yeah.
And, and, and I got to say, you know, even though I was asleep, um, you know, I, it, it, it's a big deal. You know, you want, you want people to like the film that you do, but, you know, you can't kind of make the film f for them or else you're going to be just going ping pong and back and forth. Um, so I really, it meant a lot, a lot, a lot. It still means a lot that the family likes the film. I mean, that's just, just uh, you know, re really, really important for me. Uh, the question was, it will eventually be going for, for, to PBS. Yeah, it's for, it, it will be on American Masters and, on, and PBS. It's also the BBC in London put money in, um, and they've sold it to a lot of markets o overseas. But it will eventually be uh, on, on American Masters on PBS, yeah. Other, other questions? Yeah. Uh, are you, we'll get you next. Go ahead. <laughs> Improvisational, it was a dialogue with the audience at the time. Were there ever performances where you left the stage statement, oh my gosh, this shouldn't have been shared with the masses? This one audience got to stand about the matter, but it was so brilliant that you wish it had been able to be shared. <coughs> oh, okay, I, I, I couldn't hear you very well, but you said, was there ever a concert was there ever what we, that we thought was really more special than others? Yeah, you thought this, this audience got it tonight, but this was so brilliant, if you wish that it should have been shared with you now, as opposed to just that one issue, that There were <laughs> many nights that, that... You're still having them, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> He's still <laughs> Well, uh, they're, they're still out there, floating around somewhere. You know, it's just outside of this earth right now. Sound just continues to to flow. You know, but but you're right. There are some concerts that I, that, you know, wish had been captured because I wish I could hear hear it hear it back. <laughs> <laughs> There are some uh, um, special experiences like, like that. I, I wanted to just, just uh, is there, is there a question for Herbie and Wayne? Because this is really special. They, they, they just came tonight and we got them. And so I want, <laughs> and I want to ask questions of Herbie and, and, and Wayne. Yeah. Oh, can I say one thing before you ask your question? When we recorded Nefertiti, Oh my God! That Wayne Wayne Shorter wrote. Hey Wayne, remember that the take that we played before the one they recorded? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that the one we re they recorded was the was our attempt to play the one that they didn't record. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. And then, and then, then when, one, one very important thing happened after they missed what we thought was recorded. Uh, right after that, we, yes, we did another take. And then, then uh, Miles said to Tio Macero, you know, the, the engineer, and, and uh, he, he said, Tio, from now on, if you see me do like this, you do like that. <laughs> Before they used to say, Columbia Records, number 385-7438-694, take five, or whatever it was. And by the time they say all those numbers, you almost forgot what the tune was. <laughs> so from that, that point where Miles said, you do like that, they didn't say any numbers, they just kept rolling the tape. Mm, 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 mm. And they uh, never missed anything again after that. Uh, how about for Wayne? Yeah. Well, the question I wanted to ask both uh, Mr. Hancock and Mr. Schroeder, you guys played with this you know, fabulous band leader. What did you guys learn about leading 
your bands and then the bands that you led. What did you take from, from the master in how to run a, a band on your own and, and a great job on the stage with Will's Army? The, the main thing I learned working with Miles, it was like with Miles, is uh, leave everybody alone. Mm. Because Miles Davis was like university and beyond. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with uh, what Wayne said. He, one of the first things I learned from Miles was, was something that every human being should learn, and that is the importance of listening. I wasn't aware of how important that was until I noticed that, and this was actually before Wayne joined the band, that when we play, when we were playing primarily clubs at that time, rather than concerts, that when Miles would play his solo part, something happened that made the band sound like one unit. And I, never, I, I couldn't figure out how did it happen that as soon as Miles would start, it sounded like one single direction as a one person was playing each of the instruments. And what I realized, I listened more closely, and I started to realize that Miles played certain rhythms for his solo that reflected in some way something that Tony Williams was playing on the drums. But then I listened, I started to think about Ron Carter on bass. And sometimes Miles would play like a phrase that would go up when Ron would play a phrase going down. And I also noticed that if I shifted the chords in some way, and I, I like doing that, you know, <laughs> finding some new avenues, that Miles would shift his way of playing based off of what I did. So he included everybody in the shaping of his own solo. So we weren't background players. We were all sharing in what was being produced through his horn. And that's what made the band sound like one person. Because when Miles played, he was including everybody. That taught me a, a big lesson about humanity, is that we are one species, and we be can become a better species if we listen to each other. All right. Yeah. All right. Um, before we, we, got, we just have a little more time, I, I just want to um, uh, just introduce uh, Corky McCoy. Are you, you're in here summer. Corky, stand up. Where's Corky? Corky. Yeah. Thank you, Corky. So, uh, and Sandra's wife. So, and so Cork and, and Blair, who did the poster. So Corky is, is the last person that talks in the film. He said that once I got him crying, you know, he knew I was going to use that. But Corky is the last person that talks. But also, uh, um, you know, and, and, and was a great friend, friend of Miles. But also, uh, Corky is an is a incredible illustrator um, and, 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 and did the cover of On the Corner and Water Babies and I, I don't know what else. But Corky is an incredible illustrator. Plus... Corky shot all the home movies of Miles boxing, of Miles on the beach, of Miles in his cars, and, and all that stuff Corky shot. And, and, uh, and Sandra tells the great story of, of, of Miles and, and how he comes out on stage and nobody knows he has that rasp. And he kind of um, you know, um, has that kind of very hurt look on his face. And Blair, uh, their daughter, did the poster. <laughs> so. Wow. 
And, Cor- and Corky will be here to do the Q&A on Sunday afternoon at 410. So that's going to be great because Corky shot all that footage and, and there's, a, there's great stories about how, how that footage was shot. Okay, we got a couple more questions. No, we don't have any more time. No more time. None. None. All right, I just want to say thank you to everybody. You've all thank been you. so great. But a special thanks, you know. No, I'm a special thanks to everybody. To Aaron, to Carl, who's running out because I don't know what, what's, what's... He's got to get some more popcorn. Uh, <laughs> he's going to hug Wayne. So um, to Herbie, thank you so much. To Vince, who's just been great. And please let people know. Tell people we're here at 710 tomorrow with Q&A and then 410 on Sunday. But we're here all day, every day. Um, you're the only advertising we, we got, so please let people know. And Herbie, thank you. Thank Wayne, you, Stanley. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you all for the music even more. <laughs>